I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Connolly practices right here in San Francisco at UCSF. She is um, the professor of medicine at UCSF, specializing in rheumatology and dermatology. Um, she's got a wonderful reputation, uh, everybody's admiration, and I cannot tell you how many patients have told me how much they love Dr. Kerry Connolly. Um, the, the fact that you have the ability to, to do medicine, but in a, in a loving way, is, is a wonderful combination. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kerry Connolly to you. And she is going to speak to you um, about some specialty practices for scleroderma patients. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, can you all hear me with this? Yes? Good. Um, well, I have to thank Mary and the rest of you for inviting me. I love coming to these meetings, and I always am the one who learns the most from them. So thank you for sharing that with me. Today, this afternoon, your last kind of talk. Oops. Today, this afternoon, for your last talk, um, we're going to focus a little bit on the skin in scleroderma. And um, my very first goal here for you is I'm going to go through, this is kind of a thing that has been annoying me for a long time is I want to make sure you know exactly what type of scleroderma you have and so when you because there are different types and so when you go to the doctors you can you know at least step one we're all communicating on the same page of what you have and um, this isn't your fault it's that it's a it is a, a tricky disease that does present in different ways um, but we ha as doctors have kind of created a lot of language which is not really intuitive. So I hope to go over today just kind of what is the basic language and let's make sure you all know exactly which type you have um, by the end of this. Then we'll focus on the skin specifically and some treatment options for the skin. So the world, to me, the world of um, hard skin, so you guys have something called hard skin, and um, it's, we, we doctors t say the medical term for hard skin is sclerosis, and that's where you get kind of that scleroderma thing. And we divide hard, so if you come to your doctor with hard skin, we, you, live, you have to live in this quadrant. You're e either up here in the top quadrant or on the left as morphia, something that's localized and does not have systemic involvement, or you look like morphia, and we call that morphia form conditions, or you're on the other side of the quadrant, and you have scleroderma, which for me, I'm going to say, is, uh, when I say the word scleroderma, that is synonymous with systemic sclerosis. It's hard to say systemic sclerosis all the time, so scleroderma is that abbreviation. A huge point of confusion, however, comes in with this morphia term. The other name for morphia is under localized scleroderma. I cannot tell you how many patients come to me or when I, give the, when I give the lecture at the national meeting on localized scleroderma, I would say half the patients in the room are there in the wrong place. They, don't, you know, they just got kind of misplaced. So we're going to talk a little bit about today. We hope that we can get rid of that term, localized scleroderma. So I struck it out. However, most rheumatologists, most doctors still sort of refer to it that way, and we find it very confusing. So over here, if you're in the quadrant of scleroderma, which is what we're going to spend most of the time later talking about, your differential diagnosis also includes this whole other group of things called sclerodermoid conditions. And that, my next slide is the kind of slide they always say never show. So this is the kind of slide you should never show. Why? It's so busy. But my point here is that this is what your doctor is confronting when you walk in the door. We've got to figure out what bucket you're going to go into. And there's a lot of possibilities. And so it is confusing. Um, and it can take a while for us to sort this out. And so you could be in this top bucket over here with morphia, or all these other things down here, or you could be in the scleroderma bucket, and then you could, or be in all, any of those things down there. Those buckets tend to be stable. You don't tend to run around from one bucket to another. So that is good news. It should be somewhat good news, but it can be confusing. You don't have to memorize any of that, but our doctors do. So I'm going to start with the first and most common group, which is morphia. And I just want to make sure we all have a clear sense of what that looks like on the skin. So here is how morphia 
is kind of broken down. You can have all these different variants. You can have plaques. You can have a linear form. You can have a, a form that looks atrophic. There are many, many, many different variants. I'm going to show you a few examples. So here's the most classic form of morphia. This is the most common. It's simply called plaque-type morphia. And you get these large asymmetric plaques on your back, typically. It can happen other places, but the back is the most common. It is characterized by this ivory center and a lilac border. The lilac border is supposed to be kind of when it's active and spreading, and then oftentimes it'll turn just brown or hyperpigmented. There are many variants, which we won't go over. But again, the doctors have to kind of know what the variants are. Generalized morphia is when you have more than three, uh, four to three, so more than four plaques that are more than three centimeters large across the back and involving two different anatomic sites. So generalized morphia probably represents 10% of the morphia group. And these folks are the folks who do have um, more complaints about how it feels. Here's more, a more extreme example of generalized morphia where you see this, these confluent areas over the back. It's indurated, it's hyperpigmented, it can occur on the trunk, abdomen, and legs. It usually is symptomatic. It looks a lot like something we call chronic graft versus host disease. And there's a variant in children called disabling pansclerotic morphia of children. There is, however, and this is really important good news, there is, however, no internal organ involvement. You can have some joint pains, you can have some fatigue, you can have some other stuff, you can have positive ANAs, which we have to work on and sort out, but you do not have uh, internal organ involvement. So you don't need to be having all the pulmonary tests. This was a recent, kind of a these are kind of the classic patients who come to us. This woman came in, a 39-year-old, and she had these big plaques on her abdomen. And so she'd gone on the internet, she was told by her doctor that she had systemic sclerosis. Now in this case, she does not have systemic sclerosis. This is generalized morphia on her abdomen. And again, a much different diagnosis, and it's really important to be able to sort that out. Linear scleroderma is another variant, where it kind of goes like a stripe down the leg. This is often more common in children, um, but we do see it in some adults. Uh, it can attach to the deeper tissue. You can get joint contractures, which can be problematic. And again, no internal organ involvement with uh, linear scleroderma. Here's another variant of linear scleroderma that is called incutisab, the cut of the, of the uh, saber, saber. This typically involves the forehead and scalp, and it is associated with a, a scarring alopecia. Uh, there, in this instance, although there isn't internal organ involvement, you can have seizure disorders. There can be some scarring and some involvement of the brain. Um, there are changes on MRIs, so when we see this in children, we do get MRIs to look at that. There can be some ocular and auditory, or that means eye or ear changes. Eosinophilic fasciitis is another rare variant. I really like this variant, however, because it's a variant that we can treat. It does res it's the only variant that really responds well to prednisone. It's rare. It's less than 5% of the group. It's a sudden on onset, sometimes exercise-induced. You get the symmetrical of the upper arms and limbs. It spares the ha hands, feet, and face, however, and there's no Raynaud's phenomena. These can ch changes have been referred to as potorange or cobblestone. It has this so-called groove sign. You must do a biopsy to make the diagnosis. There is a p there, half the time you get elevated eosinophils, and the other half you do not. It, is, it does respond to moderate dose prednisone. Biopsies. So for the morphia family, you have to have biopsies. Um, these, are di these are relatively diagnostic. Um, and the other day I was talking to one of my pediatric rheumatology colleagues, and they had a kid who had a morphia on the face, and it was very classic. And so in ch children on the face, I guess you don't have to do biopsies. But for the most part, we like a biopsy. It is, it is diagnostic. You see these swollen collagen bundles you see these inflammatory infiltrates. And that's the little purple uh, dots here. That's important because that tells us if we think you're going to respond to the immunosuppressive. Um, so we'd like to look at that. Now, what about this morphia group that you sort of stay stable? Well, it's kind of good news. It classically is going to be active, supposedly, for three to five years. And then it kind of becomes a quiescent scar. Now, it doesn't go away children will still have that leg lymph, that leg will look abnormal. So you have to, again, it's sort of about setting expectations. You don't want to promise it will, it will stop spreading, but it won't necessarily go away, and they'll still have the, a scar on their leg. There are rare reports of spontaneous remissions in the literature, 
but it has an excellent prognosis, and again, because it doesn't have any internal organ involvement. So you can see why it's so important that we get you in the proper category. And then the question I get always at the meeting is, if I have morphia, or this form of localized scleroderma, will I go, will I ever get systemic sclerosis? And I, um, I, I tell my patients that I give them a money back guarantee. <laughs> if they have morphia and, event, and someday show up with systemic sclerosis, I'll give them all their money back because it should not happen. So you really should if we've done our job right. But it can be confusing when you initially present. Sometimes it's one location, sometimes it's a different location. So I think we all have to have some compassion. We, have, we need to have compassion for you guys and you have to have compassion for us. Um, okay. So now I went through the morphia category that is the most common. And so for that reason, as a dermatologist, rheumatologist, I wound up seeing quite a lot of morphia. So what about morphia form conditions? And again, just to make you have some sympathy if you're studying for your boards exam, if you're a dermatologist or rheumatologist, you have to memorize this entire list. So I won't make you memorize the list. We'll just do the first one at the top, which is one of the more common causes of sort of fake morphia or morphia form things. The most common cause is our injections. So whether or not you're doing a localized injection in your skin, and it can really be pretty much anything you might inject. And people inject all kinds of things, some reasons for medicines, typically, most commonly it's various medications that are being injected. And on, on this very long list, the red at the bottom is a TNF, and we had a case at UCSF um, of this woman that I want to show you. She is a 63-year-old woman who had a history of rheumatoid arthritis and she was being treated with her etanercept, and she was getting a weekly subcutaneous injection, and she began to notice these plaques all over her abdomen in the site of her injections. The biopsy showed morphia, and she had a positive uh, ANA as well as a positive rheumatoid factor and had rheumatoid arthritis. So she had etanercept-induced generalized morphia plaques. So that's kind of something we see. So now we're going around our quadrant. We're going to zero in eventually on system sclerosis, but I'm going to talk a little bit, just two slides on scler dermoid conditions. And again, this is a table from a textbook that I wrote, um, a chapter of um, scleroderma and a textbook that I wrote. And this is just our everything that can look like scleroderma. Again, that long, long list. Some things on the list are um, rare. And so in medicine, when you have something rare, we call it a zebra. And so some of those things on that list are zebras. So I won't make, again, won't, we won't go over that in any length, but I just want to have you have a sense, a sort of understanding of how we do have to work and sort these things out. Now, we're going to finish on scleroderma systemic sclerosis and go through those subsets and make sure that you guys have a sense of where you belong in those subsets, because the vast majority of you here today, I think, are in this subset. So we like to divide these into these sort of four areas, but the most common two are limited and diffuse. And so we, it's a very lot of verbiage. What you say is you say, I have systemic sclerosis with limited scleroderma. You are literally supposed to say a sentence for your diagnosis. And you can see why that would be hard. You get exhausted. Same way, thing for diffuse. You are supposed to say, I have systemic sclerosis with diffuse scleroderma. Because that is way, way, way too much to say, what we use are abbreviations. And the abbreviation we use for the subsets are most commonly are limited or diffuse. And so when you go to your doctor, you should know, am I limited or am I diffuse? There are some rare intermediates. There are some rare systemic sources without scleroderma things. But for the most part, you should fall into a limited or diffuse. There are also people who have mixed connective tissue disease and overlap syndromes, but we will not or have both lupus and uh, with their scleroderma, but we won't talk about those today. So what, so the most, probably the most common symptom you all have that differentiates you from everybody else on that list is the Raynaud's phenomena. So by having this vasospasm of your fingers, this is a whole, it, it, so it involves your hands, you have this sensitivity to cold, you get these white digits, they then can turn uh, pink and blue, that is, unique to you. It, beyond that, though, it's not just happening at the, at the macro level of your big blood vessels. It's also happening at the microvascular le level. And so you have this, so this is the scleroderma pattern up here. That's normal. And this is scleroderma where you see, start to see, the, there are two patterns. You initially see these little 
telangiectasias, uh, and then these little white areas where you lose the blood, uh, blood vessels. So this is a very interesting uh, microvascular problem that you have in scleroderma, and you have it early in the disease. So then what happens? So classically, you start in this edematous phase, so most of you will go through a period where your hands are edematous. The photos of edematous hands are not very impressive. Oftentimes people take off their rings, you know, and so that's another thing. Here is where I did a biopsy, and you can sort of see how it really is swollen, even where the biopsy is sort of taken. They, they usually heal beautifully, but they are edematous. And then after that phase, and that can last months, then you get something we usually call the indurated phase. Now your skin is, now it's starting to feel harder. So that, that edema where you could kind of make a mark and push on it, starting to go away. And it's being replaced by really hard collagen. And this just feels very hard. And this woman's hands are actually in a flex, they're frozen in that position. And then finally, of course the worst thing is the atrophic phase where your skin now is quite thin, um, but your hand is quite, it can be quite, quite crippled. We don't want that to happen. So let's go back and review to compare these two groups again so you are really clear about why you're in one and not the other. Um, I have a very high-tech test that I do with my patients. It's called the handshake. Uh, uh, it's very inexpensive. <laughs> um, so if you, have, if you have a normal handshake, you don't have scleroderma. Uh, if you have a normal handshake, um, you have no hand involvement classically. The, the morphia patient doesn't get the rain outs or those nail capillary changes. It's kind of a patchy involvement. The face is involved much less commonly. We do have positive ANAs, but not the ones that go with the um, systemic sclerosis group. And there are, no, again, no internal organ involvement. And that's to compare you to systemic cirrhosis or scleroderma, and you do have an abnormal handshake at every phase, but pretty much. We have to be gentle because you often have ulcers and all the rest of it. And that means that you typically have sclerodactyly and hard and having a hard fingers and hands. That is the sine qua non of systemic cirrhosis and scleroderma. So that is really what we have to do to make that diagnosis. You also have the Raynaud's phenomena. You do have the nailful capillaries. Classically, it's symmetric, and there is facial involvement. You have, most of you, 85%, not 100%, but 85% will have positive ANAs, and then you get those subserologies, and you get internal organ involvement. So again, just to re, uh, talk, re enforce what I was saying, so for morphia, you have this little patchy involvement. It's asymmetric, it's localized, and it really doesn't go deeper than the skin. For the scleroderma, you have symmetric and generalized involvement. So now I'm going to go into more detail a little bit on what does the limited, so that limited subset look like. So the limited subset is actually a little bit bigger amount of the group. You're 60% of the group. You're a little bit more common. It's most common that your Raynaud's phenomena has preceded your diagnosis. It can be for decades, five years, 10 years, decades. So often that the patient has maybe been, you know, they're having that Raynaud's phenomena, and you're kind of following them, and maybe they're having some changes, maybe they're not. It can be very subtle, but that begins first. You also get these squared off telangiectasias in the face. Um, th these are very, very characteristic. They are, however, a lot of my patients, you know, wear makeup that you can kind of hide them, so sometimes you don't sort of appreciate them. Your face in general, however, is really pretty normal. It looks very, it doesn't look, ab it doesn't look as pulled. It looks really pretty subtle. It has a, a more indolent co course, but you still get internal organ involvement, and it starts later. It typically can start at five to 10 years. It is associated with the anti-centromer antibody. It has a better prognosis than the uh, diffuse subset, but it still does have serious consequences uh, for internal organ involvement. This also is referred to as the Crest syndrome. Now, I, I love the Crest syndrome. Um, because it's so descriptive, and when I get a call from a resident or the emergency room and they say, I have a Crest patient, I know exactly, you know, I can pic picture exactly what I have. They have calcinosis, they have Raynaud's, they have esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasias. But the American College of Rheumatology decided that that, uh, no, that that acronym was not helpful in terms of not everybody had everything, and so they have said we shouldn't use this, and we should, this is the group we should just refer to as the limited group. So if you've been told you have the Crest syndrome, you can say you have the limit, you're the, in the limited subset. And this is an ancient um, graph from Tom Metzger, who is a, 
wonderful uh, sort of head, you know, senior rheumatologist in Pittsburgh who studied scleroderma for just, just gener generations and is really, you know, a, a wonderful, wonderful person. But he just, I, I think this graph is very useful because it, it outlines the two subtypes. Um, and, it, um, and, and it shows you sort of how they're different and how they're similar. On the lower line here is the group that we are going to call the limited. And this group is limited because you don't get so much fir uh, fibrosis of your skin. And again, it starts over years. You, at first, you have that edematous phase where your hands may, just your hands may be swollen, and then you get the intermittent telangiectasia phase. But classically, he pointed out, even you know, 20, 30 years ago when he began to study this, he pointed out how that pulmonary artery hypertension and malabsorption and stuff does tend to be worse later in the disease. So that it has sort of a different pace. And if you contrast that to the upper line, the upper line is the folks, this, these are the folks who have the diffuse subset. And in this case, usually there's you know, very significant progress, you know, thickening of the skin. In the first five, four to five years, it usually really it is, it can be very impressive, your edema, your induration, and you sort of peak with your hard skin, maybe around four to five years. And at that point, the skin can sort of start kind of turns this corner and kind of starts to become uh, more uh, th thinner again. So that's the diffuse subset pattern. And here's an example of that. Again, you see this is 35% of the group. You have diffuse skin involvement. That means it's sort of everywhere. You have these very characteristic facial features. You have the sort of the thinning of the lips. The nose is pinched. It's kind of there's more pulling. And here we have internal organ involvement, and it's very important to know that this can occur early, within the first five years. So you want to be aggressive about, you know, looking for internal organ involvement in those first five years. This is the one that's associated with the anti y summarized antibody, and also these anti-RNA polymerase antibodies. It can be rapidly progressive. It can have a bad prognosis, and with an increased mortality. Again, a skin biopsy. A skin biopsy, you don't, for the systemic cirrhosis group, you don't have to have a skin biopsy. And you sort of see why here. It's a little bit boring. It just has a lot of collagen. Um, it, it looks sort of similar to morphia. So, so on, under the microscope, we cannot differentiate morphia from systemic cirrhosis. And so that does lead to a huge amount of misunderstandings. But we can usually figure it out clinically pretty quickly. There are vascular changes. Uh, and you don't necessarily need that biopsy. We study the biopsies, but we don't need them to make a diagnosis. So again, I just want to summarize um, in, in what I was talking about. So with your systemic cirrhosis, you have 95% of you have skin involvement. That is the universal thing almost. It's important to know about your internal organ involvement. 85% or so will have GI, very common. Pulmonary, half. And pulmonary is the most common cause of de early death for these patients. Renal used to be the most common cause of death, and even heart involvement can occur. So the internal organ involvement is super important, and that's why you do need to be managed by a rheumatologist classically who can help you know, monitor and treat and look for these things. But at the same time, all of you kind of got in trouble with your skin initially classically. So how do we um, work you up? Well, when you come in and we, you have hard skin, we, what, we're going to do a whole bunch of things. The first thing we want to know is how long has it been going on? What are your symptoms? Does it itch? Does it hurt? Is it active? And that usually means are you getting new areas that are involved? Do you have new lesions? On examination, we're going to focus very much on, huh, is this just a localized little bit of skin that we're seeing, or th is this all over the place? Is it asymmetric or is it symmetric? Is it superficial or is it deep? In, uh, in children, does it go over a joint, and is there a joint contracture? We care a lot about the color. Is it red? Is it violet? Is it brown? Is it white? There's a whole rainbow of kind of colors that tell it and give us some information about what this might be. And as I said before, the skin biopsy is very helpful, and laboratories are very helpful. So we do the skin biopsies, and here's just some labs we do. There's not a one lab test that, that um, we do, but I, I like to kind of get this sort of panel of lab tests, and if we're going to use methotrexate or medications like that, we need even a few more. So this is the end of the thir first third of my talk, and so I'm hoping you're sitting there and you now really know what subset you fit into. Um, and I, um, if you don't, you know, and there's no questions, come see me afterwards. And now I'm going to just transition and talk a little bit more specifically about skin. And as I told you, 
The skin is super important in scleroderma. It's kind of a no-brainer as a dermatologist. 95% <laughs> of you have it. It's the very first thing that happens. It, it is more than any other organ uh, combined. It is the first thing that you will have, and it changes over time. And the changes are very complicated. You know, it can start with edema, and then it can go into fibrosis. There's a lot going on in the skin that we don't, we don't explain well or measure well. It is challenging to measure, and we, and we still lack good treatments for this. So I just wanted to go over again. You know, we say hard skin, but there's a lot, again, there's a lot more to that word hard skin than is conveyed by that. There's, there's edema, there's induration, there's atrophy, but also, how about all this bound down quality? How do you measure that? How do you say that? And yet you all know what I'm talking about. You have this bound down skin. It feels tight. There's pulling. And it changes over time. Some periods you'll go through, it'll be more active. And other periods, it'll be less active. On top of the thickness changes, there's a myriad of other changes that happen. M most impressive is the area of pigment. You can, you can darken, you can lighten, you can do a combination of things. You have those telangiectasias, which often are these little red matted areas. You have calcinosis, which can be subcutaneous hard red nodules. You can lose your hair, you can lose your sweat, you itch, uh, and it can be painful. Measuring the skin, skin has not, even though I showed you that beautiful um, natural history slide from Dr. Tom, uh, Tom Metzger, and he's a genius, and, the, and that's, the, that's the Rodnam skin score uh, was taken from that. Even though we have that, it's still under studies and for research purposes is not is kind of inadequate. Our ability to really do a good job of measuring the skin objectively and its change over time is still leaves a lot to be de desired. But skin scores are the, the dominant thing that we use. And we do this Rodnam skin score or a modified Rodnam skin score, which is where we judge, um, I have a picture of it. We look at 51 different areas and we judge it from zero to three. Here it is. Um, and uh, by pinching it, and, and then we add that up. So you see we have seven, excuse me, 17 sites, and we judge, uh, here are the sites, and then we, you essentially pinch them, and then you measure, is it zero, one, two, or three, uh, zero being nor, nor, uh, normal, and then you get a score, and that's your modified random skin score. The little graph on the right is meant to sort of show you that it's kind of a big mess, because when you add these all together, if we added everybody in the room together for your modified skin, random skin score, it, it's kind of a mess. Some folks get really rapidly progressive scores, other people's just kind of, you know, peter out here in the middle, others never m amount to much of anything if you're in the limited group. Especially if you're in the limited group, this is not a particularly good measure or sensitive measure for you. A couple of words about calcinosis, uh, cutis, because um, I know Mary asked me to talk, talk about it, and I don't have a whole lot of um, stuff to sort of tell you on this, but this can be very, um, this can be very po um, painful and problematic. It tends to be a, a finding that comes later in the disease. Um, maybe anywhere from 20 to 40% of patients have these sort of calcium deposits under the skin. It can really be associated with very significant um, deformities and be very problematic for patients. Therapies are lacking. We don't, you know, like all of scleroderma, the therapies here are not great. Um, basically, no specific therapy works that well. You know, people think um, if we are very aggressive with immunosuppression early in the disease that perhaps we block it. And there are examples of a related disease like called dermatomyositis, which often occurs when they get these subcutaneous, they get muscle, they get calcium in the muscles. And now that people are more aggressive treating with immunosuppression, it seems like perhaps there's less of that complication, so that's something people have thought about. Um, interlegional catalog injections, sometimes for localized areas if it's really bothering you. Vasodilation to improve the blood flow, and so examples of that would be calcium channel blockers like diltiazem that we would use, be using for your rainouts. Probenicid and colchicine are drugs that we use in gout. Um, and again, I've not been very impressed with their use here. Colchicine blocks um, neutrophils and things, and some pe again, people feel like it maybe blocks some inflammation before it happens. The bisphosphonates have also been tried without much luck. I'm very old, and one of the very first things when I, when I came on the scene to try for uh, calcium, uh, uh, for cutaneous 
um, for calcinosis was warfarin or, or Coumadin. So I put a bunch of my patients early on on Coumadin. But this is a blood thinner, and this is a, it's a really mess to use. You have to get PT, PTs, you have to get blood work every week. You get, have to be careful of your diet, intera interacts with everything under the sun. And so I did about five or so patients, and they were overwhelmingly impressed with it, and it is a hard thing to use, so we just stopped using it. There's myo-inositol hexophosphate out there, which is a, a, some sort of a dietary supplement. I just read about it online myself, and I don't, I've never used it, but there's something on that. Minocycling or some of these antibiotics have been used. And the final thing on the list here is this, this sodium thiosulfate. Um, so you can, use the, you can use this either IV or you can I use it interlesionally. And there's also the Mayo Clinic has a topical preparation that they find helpful to use on open wounds that are happen happening over the calcinosis cutis. And so now we have about three to four patients in the clinic that we've tried, uh, we're trying on this uh, sodium thiosulfate. What about lithotripsy? You know, so that's how we break up those kidney stones and stuff. Um, there have been some reports from Europe um, on, this, on doing this. And we did do a little trial at UCSF. Um, we tried to do this at UCSF. The problem is, is that lithotripsy um, can't be near any other bones. Uh, that's why it works great for your center of your body, like a gallstone, um, where you have a lot of fat and a lot of bones. If you have um, your calcineus right over the bone of your finger, that apparently the lithotripsy will just like break up the whole thing. And so it just not, it's not a good idea. So that has not moved forward. Surgical excision in the selected patient can be, uh, you know, I've learned we, there's a lovely hand plastic surgeon down at Stanford who I've had a few of my patients who just wind up having just one digit, one area that's just been unbelievably difficult for them and not responding to any of the therapies. And so sometimes under with somebody who has a, a surgeon with experience, it, it's okay to try. The problem is, is obviously it doesn't keep it from coming back and it's just a temporary solution, but and, um, but if you, but that can, then might be something for some people. It's okay, you know, the relationship between these calcium deposits in your skin uh, and your circulating calcium levels and your bone levels of calcium, it's not a very clear relationship at all. And so the studies have indicate that if you need to take a calcium replacement, for example, for your osteopenia porosis, problems, if you need to be on a calcium supplement, you may. You, this does not, if you have calcinosis cutis, you don't, that does not prevent you from doing that. So now I'm going to transition and just finish with the little time I have left on just talking sort of treatment in general on the, la the latter for this, and I'm going to be focusing on skin. Um, and the, the morphia and the, and the systemic, the, we have, there are some shared features, and so we're going to kind of go over that. So here's my ladder. So the, la the first step of the ladder is topical therapies. The next step of the ladder are UV light therapies, and the top of the ladder are systemic therapies. And importantly out here, before you get to topicals, even, is that you may opt not to do anything um, because you know some of this doesn't work. So I talked to you earlier about itching of the skin. Itching is, can be very significant for patients. Oftentimes in the first few years of the disease, the itching can be their chief complaint. Um, and so here, you want to take excellent care of your skin. And by this, I mean lubrication. Your skin will, is, tends to be dry as it is. So you, you just want to be good at getting some sort of over-the-counter lotion like, that you like. Vanna cream is very popular. You can buy it at Walgreens. Vanna cream was developed by the Mayo Clinic for their babies with atopic dermatitis. So it's very safe. It has no preservatives, no fragrance, and it's yet it's very lubricating. So I like Vanna cream and it's no prescription, and it's reasonably priced. Now, you can consider topical steroids, and so we do put in a little bit of steroid, but you know, in, in an early patient with a lot of itching, a, steroid, a topical steroid can be very helpful. But oftentimes, by the time you've had this for a long time and your skin is super hard, the topical steroids don't work that well. So you can try them, but I'm not gonna hold out that much help um, that will work. Antihistamines. I mean, we have, we have a whole itch clinic at UCSF full of people who are sort of miserable. So you have to kind of, you have to kind of, so we basically use the same regimens as we use for them. And so we use a lot of antihistamines and you can use them together and there's non-sedating and sedating and we have a whole package of how to do this. But it's very, very important. You can actually use the antihistamines over the counter at higher, much higher doses than they're given there and that's one of our tricks. Um, the other thing is that the UV light therapy too for patients can help. One word about sunscreen for, so 
you know, for lupus and for everything else, we're always yelling at you to stay out of the sun. For scleroderma, this, this, you may get unusually tan in the sun, but you don't have an increased, it doesn't flare your disease, and you don't have any increased risks of skin cancer. So I mentioned to you, uh, so now we're gonna do the morphia, so the topicals, and this just shows you a breakdown of the topical. So if, and when I, my regimen is usually to pick out a corticosteroid twice a day for three months, and then we'll maybe go to tacrolimus. Tacrolimus is the only one that's been shown in a double-blind trial to work. However, tacrolimus is super expensive, and I'm an old, again, I'm an old person, so I've been here forever. The corticosteroids work just fine. Um, but we'll maybe go switch to that. And you can try the, the other ones on here as well. So we like to try the topicals if we can. Um, I do want to talk to you about light therapy because I myself have been learning more and more about light therapy. We don't really do it for the systemic patients, but for the morphia patients, you can really use all kinds of light therapy. And this is an area that, you know, is really uh, expanding. And again, as a dermatologist, it is something we do. And the one story I like to sort of share is we have a light uh, therapy center at UCSF, and the vast majority of patients there are psoriasis patients. And so the nurses are really good at kind of getting them into the light boxes, getting the dosing and the, and the jewels and everything set perfectly and not having side effects. So the head nurse of this whole light therapy center got generalized morphia. So she came to see me and I said, you're kidding. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm not, I haven't had that much experience with this, but you know, you are the queen of the light therapy. Treat yourself with light therapy. And she did. And so she got like a complete clearing on this is the very first thing here we'll call narrowband UVB. And so she never came back. She retired, but I did run into her at a party and I said, whatever happened to that? And she said, yeah, at about six to 12 months, her generalized morphia got much, much better. So I do have a, a real respect for this. Heidi Jacoby and other people uh, who is a, uh, is, a, is a dermatologist who is at in Texas, at, in Dallas, uh, she has really bought, the, this is a, the UVA-1 therapy is the special sort of German light that is supposed to be the most sort of anti-fibrotic. It's very expensive and so we at UCSF will never have it. But she, um, but she uses it and she has written a lot about this and says that it does work well. I think the thing you have to tell your patients though is that it can cost a bit. The insurance um, can be hard to get on this and it does take a while, one to two years or about 80 treatments. But, uh, but this is an area that I think if you have hard skin and you're worried about other kinds of side effects, we can get a benefit from this. Um, and again, this is just a slide that kind of explains that. We started using UV for uh, psoriasis many years ago. And then in the early 90s, again, mostly uh, Europeans, particularly Germans, started to look at this for localized scleroderma and morphia. And they have a whole lot of um, nice, um, this is Andrew Kreuter's work from Germany, who wrote, up, uh, wrote about this. Um, and they have some really lovely uh, results. When they looked at, uh, did a sort of a meta-analysis to compare, again, the Narovan UVB was similar to the PUVA, which is UVA1, and to this fancier, newer wavelength of UVA1. It's safe, it, does, it is time-consuming, and it can be expensive if your insurance doesn't cover it. Okay, so now we're at the top of our pyramid for morphia. And the top of the pyramid for morphia is the systemic therapy. Now, the classic drugs out there are Plaquenil, which is hydroxychloroquine, and D-penicillamine. The reason they're sort of above this line for me is that they don't really do that much. Most of the patients, you, m many of you have been on that for some period of time. I think it's fine to try it, but the vast majority, sort of our sense of this is that it doesn't, the, the, these two things do not work that well. The next thing on here, though, is the combination of methotrexate with systemic steroids. And this came to us really from the pediatric uh, rheumatology literature. They did some very nice studies, some double-blind studies. And so I'm a believer that for your bad, for your worst cases of, the, of bad morphia, the combination of methotrexate with systemic sclerosis can be helpful. And then you taper the steroids and cell as low as possible. If that doesn't work, you can use mycophenolate mofetil, which is Celsept, and, and rarely azathioprine. But it was, it's the methotrexate um, prednisone that's com the most commonly used. Um, and now I, and when now I kind of review, I was talking to you more about morphia, and now I'm going to uh, transition into systemic cirrhosis. And as you know, uh, the kind of the, bug, the bugaboo, as we say when we talk about this, is you manage the disease by organ system. So you'll go through each organ system and you'll be managing it by that. You offer a lot of supportive care for pain and itching. 
And, but finally, at the end of the day, this is the, um, you, don't, you don't have a DMARD, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. That's a mouthful, but that is kind of the gold standard that you're looking for, uh, that rheumatoid arthritis has it, psoriatic arthritis has it, but we in scleroderma do not have a DMARD. So again, the system, how do you treat the organ systems? Which, the skin, you can pretty much do what I just told you about morphia. You can apply that to the systemic patient as well. Um, and then just, just to go, I didn't go through all that, but for your rain outs, you use calcium channel blockers. For the GI, you use proton pump inhibitors. For renal, you use ACE inhibitors. And for your lungs, you use either interstitial lung disease, you, you have either interstitial lung disease or pulmonary artery hypertension, and we can treat those. Having said that, there's, there's a, a relatively recent textbook on scleroderm that was just published uh, a couple years ago now, and this is the, ch the whole chapter on scler skin, which I read you know, with interest, but even in this chapter, they make the statement that no one disease-modifying uh, agent has been proven to be effective for the treatment of diffuse scleroderma skin disease. So me not the lungs, not, not the internal organs, but the skin itself, and I think that is a sad, but tr that's, a, that is a, I pre that's a true statement, I'm sorry to say, is a true statement, and we need to do better. Um, bio no, this is another area that's been disappointing for our scleroderma patients, is the biologics in scleroderma have really not been very effective. In fact, the TNF-alpha blockers, which are the very first thing that came out there for rheumatoid arthritis, not only do they not work, it can actually make you worse. So you're not supposed to have those. The inter interferons were all tried, <clears throat> they didn't work. NTG of beta-1 was tried, that didn't work. IVIG, couple reports out there, I don't think it's very effective, um, but people say um, that might help. Then anti-CD20, rituximab, again a maybe, Gleevec, a maybe, but these drugs really in their trials have been sort of under, underwhelming, not impressive. Here's just a final little table showing you kind of more uh, therapy, that, you know, so if you're really gonna, on the horizon of what we're gonna be able to use, I've talked to you a little bit about the immunomodulatory agents, and so that's your cyclophosphamide, your mycophenolate. Um, all those drugs have been tried. There's B-cell targeted therapy, there's cytokine targeted therapy, and there is an anti-IL-6 ectomira trial going on now at Stanford and other places, and I don't quite know, Lori Chung is doing that at Stanford, I don't, haven't really heard what the final wrap is on that. Dan first is also in charge of that trial. TGF-beta, again, very disappointing. The tyro tyronine, tyros, Tyrosine kind of say inhibitor is also not very, so far not very effective. And um, even the stem cell transplants, which are our most aggressive form of therapy, that also is an NIH trial that has been completely done in rolling, and we're waiting to sort of see the follow-up data on that. But everything I've seen in sort of preliminary papers and abstracts and presentations on that is the bone marrow transplants didn't seem, it's a, or stem, even stem cells didn't seem to be all that great. I think we still have to wait and see. So I'm gonna, I wanna finish with this slide, just saying, in summary for our treatment, we do have therapy for renal disease. We have emerging therapies for the lung involvement, including interstitial lung disease and pulmonary artery hypertension. We still lack the gold bull, golden bull, that we still need a DMAR. Um, and we need to do better in our preclinical data. We need animal models and in vitro tests. And we need better uh, outcome measures. And the skin scores are really kind of, you know, awkward and not terribly, uh, helpful. Um, I do want to finish, I have two more slides um, and to talk a little bit more about UCSF. Um, so we're doing, we are doing a trial at UCSF, uh, it's called the LOTUS trial, and this, the patients we're looking for are patients who have scleroderma and interstitial lung disease, and you take perfenidone, which is an antibiotic, uh, antifibrotic, excuse me, that you take by mouth and has been relatively safe, and they're going to be looking at two different uh, doses and as a, safe, as a safety trial. You take it orally for about 20 weeks. The nice thing about this trial, how, um, which is different than others, is that you can continue all your other medications while you're on this, and, um, and that includes Cellcept. And so I do have some Lotus handouts up here if you are interested in that sort of thing and how to get in touch with our study coordinator for that. We also, um, at UCSF, we are, you know, we are developing a, our, so we have our own little scleroderma center, and it's, it's kind of small and growing, but um, it, we meet every Friday morning uh, at the Parnassus campus. There are two rheumatologists, uh, Dr. Andy Gross and uh, Leanne Ginsler, together with myself, um, 
uh, and Dr. Anna Hamel, who's a dermatologist, and we um, can also refer you to our pulmonology specialist. I have a little handout about how to get into the clinic. We are, it's UCSF, and so I am sorry to say we are a little backed up, <laughs> but, you, uh, but there, this is how to get into the clinic. You do have to give us a little bit of time. The current studies we're doing now is we are, we do have a database, which is just putting all of your medical information into a secure database so we can kind of monitor it over time. We do have blood samples for genome, uh, for gene testing and some skin biopsy samples. And then we do, we do uh, collaborate with pulmonary to do clinical trials like the LOTUS trial I just mentioned to you. So I have information if you're interested in coming and being seen in the clinic, we'd be happy to see you. And with that, I will stop.